Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of the Garment Decorators podcast hosted by Styles UK. If those of you are watching on YouTube will be able to see that I am on my own today. I'm not joined by my co-host Andy, um, but I am very excited to be joined by Hagen who works on the Styles Europe marketing team and we are going to spend a bit of time this afternoon and just sitting down talking about different industry trends, what's happening in Europe, what's happening in the UK and just compare Comparing and analyzing everything that's going on. So, Hagen, hi, welcome to the podcast. Hello, thank you for having me here. No problem. So, do you want to give everyone listening a bit of a rundown about who you are, what you do in Styles Europe, and just a little bit more about yourself, really? Sure, sure. Um, so, I'm Hagen. Um, I've been with Styles for two years as a SEO content writer, and that has been shifting over the last years more to like creating content. And I've been also standing in front of the camera which has been fun and gave me the opportunity to meet you <laughs> over there. Also great. Yeah, that's that's mostly it. So I'm working, I'm mostly working from home, um, which allows me to be closer to my little dog, which is <laughs> great. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm doing. How have you found going from, because you, you hadn't really done much in front of the camera stuff before, mm -hmm the sort of recent shift at Styles Europe, have you? And I remember when you came here and it was like your first time and you absolutely smashed it. It was <laughs> such a productive day. And I think everyone here was almost, not that we should have been surprised, but we were like, like, wow, this is just a, such a great first day of filming. How did you find stepping in front of the camera and taking on that side of like the marketing personality? Truly is weird. It's, it's easier to just talk to people or to just pretend, um, present something um but you get used to it standing in front of the camera i think the first two or three videos i was really stumbling over my words but it got easier got easier well i mean just at the start of this podcast that we did have to do two takes on the intro to this because i was stumbling over my words so it happens all the time it doesn't matter how long you do it for we have actually got a little bit off topic but we have got a podcast coming out next week with Kelly from Styles in America and we're talking all about being in front of the camera and selling your brand for success for our customers so if you are interested in that side of things obviously that's what Hagen and I do here at Styles but if you're interested in hearing about how that could help your business more then I definitely recommend checking out next week's episode as well. Would you agree Hagen that if people know more about your brand story it gives you more of that personable approach and they feel like they connect with your brand more and have more of that relationship and loyalty to buy from you for sure for sure I, um i mean not even only on social media but i think in general people really like knowing about what you are doing and who you are as a brand is that the same in europe as it is for the uk in terms of do you have many customers doing that or is it something that you're probably going to have to encourage them to do over the coming months <laughs> I, I think people are they they are striving to to do that to to be approachable as a brand um, and to get into contact with their customers and um, I think it's really useful yeah for sure um, if you as a customer if you have the feeling that someone creates something and they know what they're doing and they have like a vision in mind for that that really um, makes you feel in the right place. So what have you seen from a, I want to say trend, but I, I don't know if that's the right word, in your space in the industry recently, have there been any shifts or any changes in, you know, what people are doing, what people are printing, how they're going about selling printed garments to their customers? I think what, uh, what we're seeing in the moment is like, I guess it's not even only a trend anymore, but sustainability is, is a big topic that will only get bigger probably because, so the EU is, it has to push sustainability efforts in the textile printing industry and also customers are looking for that. So like recycled uh, blanks using that or even water-based inks, um, those are things that people are actively searching for and are having success with using. <laughs> I would uh, I would go to to different topics, but we can talk about that. Yeah, definitely. I was just going to say that um, we had Zazy from Bella Canvas come in not that long ago, and she bought with her the new eco tea that they've produced. And from memory, let's see if I can get this right. They use up to seven plastic bottles per T-shirt, along with the scraps of their best-selling. 3001 t-shirt which we all 
you know, wear, I think I'm probably wearing one now, actually. And I just thought that we, we talk about sustainability all the time, but to actually see that level of recycling is such a, a big shift in the industry. And they are so easy to print on as well. I was slightly nervous that because of the polyester content in them, that they were going to mm. scorch or, you know, it might take a few steps to find the right print method, but they were so, so easy to apply our transfers to, which, like you said, are, are water-based. And how does that feel to wear seven plastic bottles? Is, 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 does it feel like a normal, <laughs> feel like a normal to, t-shirt? Or? To be honest with you, it doesn't really feel uh, that much different. I reckon if you were to give someone a normal Bella Canvas 3001 and the recycled eco tea, you probably wouldn't be able to tell much of a difference. If anything, the eco tea does have a slightly softer feel to it. Um, mm. But yeah, I, I, you wouldn't pick it up and go, this feels like a scratchy, harsh, recycled t-shirt. It's really cool. Mm -hmm. So what else from a sustainability point of view are you seeing over there? Are customers actively seeking out like blanks um, and obviously the water-based transfers? What are some of the most popular products that people, if they're in sort of, if they're in Europe, what would they be looking to use? For sure, the, um, the, the blanks are a big, uh, a big thing. So the recycled materials and also recyclable materials so that they can be used again. And just, I think what people are also looking for is any kind of stuff that has high quality and can be worn for a really long time. So not the fast fashion necessarily. And with our, with our transfers, obviously, that's easily, easily done. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> Is there, are there any products in particular that you would, that you've personally tried or that you'd recommend to anyone who was looking to lead their business in a more sustainable direction? Because I can imagine it'd be pretty difficult to, you know, if you're just printing on any random blank that you currently have mm -hmm. and you're thinking, oh, I want to make sure that my business is more sustainable. I want to, you know, take it down that road a bit more. Is there any, what, where would you recommend people start with that? Because it can be quite overwhelming. True, true. I've um, I've talked recent like last week. I've talked to a few guys who are making their own merch for their for their band, and they're using a little heat press for that. And they really wanted like high quality and like these um, heavy shirts for that. So they went with uh, I think it's just a hundred percent cotton, and I think that feels really well, and that can easily be uh, easily be uh, applied on and then you just use some DTF transfers like the ultra color max that we have that's what I talked to them about and then it was really nice because um, they wanted like a hundred prints just little prints and they were thinking this would be really expensive to have a hundred sheets but we managed to get like 20 on one page so on one master sheet and then that all was really was really simple they just printed it on at home um and now they can sell that to the to their fans so is is that more of a uh, what kind of scale is this band at in terms of like volume of selling shirts you said they've made a hundred so is this more of a local kind of band it is still kind of local but like High, high dreams. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. Because I was going to say, it's, I, I think it's great that the transfer options that we have available now and the different quantities and price breaks and things really do allow everybody to have that access to the quality and the ease of application with our, like you said, our Ultra Color Max DTF transfers or Ultra Color transfers, our digital transfers. And it's so easy now for everybody, regardless of how many you need to get that high quality finished product. It's not just, you know, the people that are selling hundreds of thousands that get to that level and can produce that. You can produce one if you wanted to and still, you know, sell your customers that quality merchandise product. It was also really great because they, uh, they wanted to film their first music video and that was like a week after uh, they ordered the DTFs but they came in time and that was super helpful I don't know if anyone else could have offered that to them to be able to immediately get to get them apply them and then film their video in that uh, in that new merch within the same day as well yeah <laughs> yeah that's pretty cool so they so they had them they've worn them in the music video i'll have to yeah. you'll have to send me a link afterwards and i can check out which yeah, uh, <laughs> which one it is <laughs> 
So what else did you have? Because I know we spoke prior to this podcast about different things that were happening in the European market. But what else did you have on your list, um, let's say, for trends and things like that that are happening in Europe? So one big thing that's coming up this June is um, the European Championship, so uh, okay. soccer. <laughs> um and it's happening in germany so where i live um and that's that's gonna be a huge thing it already is like you have a lot of like special products in the supermarkets and stuff like special european championship editions of of uh, things of drinks and stuff or like the public transport in the city where i live that has a big advertisement on the side with uh, with the soccer players and obviously making like fan merch for that is a huge thing right now i don't know is it like that in the uk too do you see a lot of uh em like advertisements in the stores the yeah we do have quite a few i mean as i said prior to this podcast in i'm probably not the most knowledgeable person to speak about the sporting side of things but from just a regular consumer point of view yeah you do get especially when you know specific events like the world cup and things like that are on you do get a lot of merchandise the football shirts with you know the vinyl numbers things like that they're all super super popular and i think it's one of those things where you it's something that you want from from a memory almost so we do mm. get quite a few customers that will produce sporting apparel like football um, shirts for those events in particular because they know that people will buy them and keep them rather than just have them for a season but then of course with football teams most seasons their kits change and that's quite a clever way of selling more customer apparel from the football team's point of view and obviously everybody all the football fans want the new kit they want the new design they don't want to be in last season's you know design so I think yeah it's definitely one of those things that just keeps going and going and going every single year for sure yeah mm -hmm. do you think that's going to be something that a lot of your heat printers out there that have hot tronics machines are going to be printed for this year I think this year for sure uh, I mean it's not only it's not only the fans it's also like the pubs and stuff that that offer the public viewing events and I think they, they could also really benefit from like offering printed stuff for for the people that come there so for for sure um we're already seeing like people using the designs to get transfers for that so what what would you recommend to people so say one of your customers comes to you and says look we've got all these events coming up this year i run a local pub or i run a local coffee shop and i want to capitalize on this and add in some custom shirts what would you recommend they do from that because it is something that local businesses probably do sit there and think about but the idea of having custom printed apparel is probably quite overwhelming if they've never done it before yeah for sure i um i mean for a lot of people when they first see how how um textiles are getting printed on it's like magic to them oh and now i have a finished and decorated shirt but i, I think there's a quite a big um like effort difference between the htvs and the transfers I think you have to put in more work for sure and you need like a, a vinyl cutter to work with HDVs. So if you just, if you want to get started, I would certainly say use transfers. And if it's a small quantity, you, you use DTFs because you can you can just order one even. Or larger quantities, um, I think screen printed transfers, they look really good. Uh, I love like these reduced colors that you get from from screen printed transfers um and then you you just need these you need a you need the blanks and you need a transfer press um and then you can make your own shirts which is amazing uh and i think that's if someone were to ask me how to do it that's how how i would do it <laughs> and the good thing for local businesses about that is even though they you know if they wanted to do that themselves and like you say buy the heat press and buy the oh something just fell off the wall sorry everyone <laughs> Um, if they wanted to do it themselves and buy the heat press, buy the blanks and print the transfers, you could do a shirt at a time whenever someone orders, right? You don't have to pre-print tens or hundreds of them just in case you don't sell them, especially if it is event related, right? But then alternatively, there's probably a lot of garment decorators in the local area that you could recommend or seek out and ask them to do some short runs for you as well. So regardless of which way you, or how you want to handle it for your business, there's definitely a way to increase your profits with custom decorated apparel. One, uh, like one thing I saw like 
yesterday on the news is that um, that we have more people than ever um, buying their own campers, like their their Wohnmobile, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and, and going like into nature and stuff. And that's also something that people are like capitalizing on right now. And that's actually uh, super interesting. I think it's like an industry that's been growing really steadily for more than 15 years or something. Yeah. Uh, like, and and I, I I get it. Like going into nature and like camping out there, it's, uh, super cool. And that's also something where people for gift giving, like we are like some kind of design that makes people who like to go camping um, appreciate it. Or even for the for the uh, uh, for the places where people camp, they they I think they can also offer these uh, prints. <laughs> That's to be honest, that's not something I thought about. I mean, we've spoken a lot on this podcast in the past about local thing, local businesses that are within five or 10 miles of where your business is set up and capitalizing on all of that, because there's a lot more on your doorstep than everybody thinks. But from a business category point of view, I'd never, ever thought of that. I mean, I suppose is the weather that much different where you are to where I am? Like it's pretty cold and rainy here most of the time. So people do still camp. It's not, not as big of a thing. Yeah. I, I guess then the weather has to be a lot different because. It's, and uh, to be fair, like a lot of people like camping is a, like a lot of people do do it. <laughs> it wouldn't have come into my head. I don't know why. I mean, it, it is, I think it's like um, one in every thousand people in Germany owns their own camper. So that's the, quite a lot. It's a huge number. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So everyone listening, if you're running a heat printing apparel decoration business in Germany, you need to make sure you're getting on that market because there's a lot of people out there that are probably waiting on buying their custom apparel. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. One more general thing that I that I've been thinking about um is like in Europe, it's true for Germany for sure, and I think it's true for, for most European countries. It's like um, all things American are quite popular here and they are getting more popular. And that is true for, for the sports, um, for, for the NFL and all of that. It's getting more and more popular around here. And American food has, I guess, has been forever <laughs> popular. And overall, the the um, I guess the American dream and all that, all those ideas behind that, making something from or going up from nothing and creating your own business or your side hustle that is something that uh, people now that that like in the pandemic it was quite difficult for people but now this is getting easier and easier people are getting into that again and i can see that like all around me where people have like their their crazy little business ideas and they are just going for that which is great I think. Did you have many people during COVID starting their own businesses? Like, was that quite a popular thing? It was like, it, it was a lot of people thinking about it and then like a few people going for it because it's like creating your own online shop is super easy these days. And you, you don't need like any expertise on that, on like web design or stuff like that. I guess you need a good idea and you need that in Germany, you need, you need to stay at it to get through all the regulations and stuff like that yeah well i think that's any that's any business though isn't it because once you have it set up you have to consistently keep chipping away at it in order for it to be successful i mean you see all of these tiktoks going around now of people going oh my business blew up overnight and even though in some cases that might be true and they might have been lucky and had like a viral social media post in general it is just chipping away day after day week after week at your business keep promoting it keep making connections with local businesses keep talking to your customers keep promoting on social media to eventually get to that point where you do have a steady income of business i think it's not it's not always necessarily an overnight success right true true but I, i've also seen these kind of like crazy little products i've, I've seen like a, a little at, around christmas uh, christmas it was like a candle holder that was shaped like a little dog And I've seen like ads for that and I knew, okay, this is like, this is the little product. They are going to put up a web shop for that. They're going to sell that around Christmas and then close the shop again. That's also, I don't know if, if that is viable for everything, but I, I can also see that a lot. Like shops opening and then closing again as soon as they hit that mark. So this, this fast paced uh, selling goes, goes also. 
I yeah, that's a good point actually, because we have some customers over in the UK that purely have a leavers like a school leavers business mm. and they will open up from I don't know December January maybe even earlier than that start get start getting in contact with customers start getting in contact with the schools securing those jobs putting the print orders through and then by June July time they close their business for the summer and then they're off again until mm. Christmas because they make enough money in that three, four, five months that they don't need to be open for the rest of the year, which is just insane. I think majority of people, if you have a heat press, I've said this before, if you have a heat press, you should be doing Levis hoodies. But if you are just running your business, like if you've got a successful business model, I think that's a great way to do it. And I suppose it depends if you're doing fulfillment or if you're doing more of like a brand thing, like the themed seasonal items are slightly different, I think. But if you're running a fulfillment business and you've got a particular area that you're selling into and you've got those relationships and you can probably afford to open and close depending on the time of year but if you're running a brand and you're trying to build up a, a presence and brand awareness and that I suppose that needs like the 365 days a year promotion brand awareness that kind of thing. Yeah, for sure. That, that needs, like you said, a chipping at it. So if somebody is listening to this podcast and they are one of your lovely European customers and they're thinking, yeah, I could do this. I could start printing my own T-shirts. Maybe they thought about it in COVID and now they're finally coming around to starting their own business. Um, what would you recommend their first steps be? How can, how can they get started from start to profit, I guess? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, uh, um, I guess it's, I guess it should start with um, with, a, with a good amount of planning in my mind at least um, like what is what is gonna be the name of your of your business that's something that's like surprisingly important to have a name that you can give to the authorities and stuff so all your paperwork gets sorted out because that takes months that, that's that's like a good <laughs> a good point to start and once you've got all the paperwork um, sorted out for you, um like i said you need you you basically just need three things you need to transfer the blanks and the transfer press um and getting a transfer press maybe the most important investment for for your for your business uh i would when you're just starting and you have just a little shop i would go for one that automatically opens so like the auto open clam because that makes it basically impossible to over apply a uh, textile so you're not going to mess that up and you're going to get perfect prints probably and you can also like if you get a call while you're heat printing you can take the call and let the press automatically open and then uh, probably i would i would go for dtfs or ultra color if you want to if you want a water-based stuff then ultra color is water-based or some screen printed transfers yeah And I guess for the planning part, most importantly, also find the right niche for you, and don't go don't go for I'm gonna do sport apparel because that's that's a huge market. I would start small, maybe look locally around you, what people are interested in. What would you say are some of the most popular sort of niches for where like in Germany where you are for like because over here it's so different. We have you know people that just print um like music tees but it'll be like a particular genre of music or there'll be a mm. really unique sport that somebody prints apparel for like we had phil from 34 north studio one of our customers came in on the podcast a while ago and he makes apparel for the bobsled team and before he came in i didn't even know what bobsled was and i was like there's so many little things like that that people can branch into and like you said if you go I want to make sport apparel that's great but it's a very very saturated market whereas if you narrow it down to something still in sport if that's what you want to do but make it a bit more specific you've probably got more chance of succeeding because there's less people trying to do that one particular thing and you can really cater what you're producing for your target market good good question like Uh, what a good niche is to go to go into like i said like the, the camping thing i think is still not it's still not overdone i've also seen a lot of i don't know if i could uh, if i should call it like memes but like funny shirts that like fit a certain like humor uh, yeah. those those also they they always catch my eye at least funny things for sure um that's what ultra color max is perfect for right if you just want to do like yeah. a 
three or four runs of one t-shirt to see if it hits properly then perfect yeah yeah sure and i guess if, if you want to like really stand out then you should go for the hdvs right Yeah, I suppose it really does depend on what product you're trying to create. So if someone was coming to you and saying like, I've, I've heard about transfers and I've heard about vinyl, like which one do you recommend I go for? What would you advise them? Mm, depends on like how much room you have. And uh, like if, if, you, if you want to create like a lot of shirts in little time, then you go for the transfers because you don't have to weed them first. But if you want to have like designs that really stand out that like, that glow in the dark or that like are glitter or that have the soft feel to them um, with like the flock, for example, then you should go for the HDVs. And I mean, we have so many customers who are um, successful with, with either or with both. <laughs> so it, re it really depends on that. I think on the size of and the, and the um, speed in which you want to create something mm -hmm. and how much you, you want the design itself to stand out and like you said you can use both together which i think is something not everybody knows mm. but depending on the type of heat transfer vinyl you are using you can layer or you can apply two different decoration types to the same shirt in some instances you can layer them obviously it depends i like i think i'd recommend sports film being like your base layer and then maybe putting glitter over the top because obviously it's a soft matte really thin finish you probably wouldn't be able to get away with putting sports film on glitter i don't think that would work <laughs> yeah. but or if you're just putting for example two decoration methods on the same shirt and they're not overlapping then providing you know you've you're using cover sheets and things like that then creating mixed media designs is a great way to make your products stand out like hargan said or increase the profit that you're making because you can charge more for different decoration finishes and multiple placements as well right for sure do you have any cool customer stories you don't have to name the business or, or the person in particular but do you have any sort of customer success stories that you've seen over at styles europe where someone's maybe come up with a unique idea or they've you know really grown their business from zero to a hundred or anything like that that people could listen to and maybe take as inspiration over my many many two years at, at styles <laughs> over <laughs> the last two years <laughs> I, I thought that super in, um, when someone came up to me and asked me how to print on sliders um, like uh, Badelatschen in German I found that really interesting um, and I how think they in German? Badelatschen ba Badelatschen close enough <laughs> <laughs> I, I found that really interesting um, because obviously yes uh, it's also a great gift to have to have your personalized sliders and they were really happy to see the the, the, the shoe plate and, um, that you can use for our presses I found that great and another thing that's, that's still um, on the top of my mind is is like a, a, some not one guy he printed at home um, in his in his living room and he has a big aquarium there with him um, and that makes the the whole room quite humid and he really struggled with with printing at home because he always he it, it never fit the way it should so we looked at that and like we talked about that and it it, it became clear that the climate meant that he needed to use a bit of a higher temperature and apply a bit longer and then it worked perfectly but i found that it, it's i found it really interesting it's like baking bread when, when yeah, you're you when you're like in a different right recipe, don't you so was it the the moisture from the aquarium was interfering with the garments and they were holding on to too much moisture and the pre-press like couldn't get it all out before the decoration went on I, i think it was like that yeah maybe maybe that would have also worked to pre-press a bit longer to get all the moisture out uh and maybe even he um he's maybe he stored his blanks there in the same room and that was also a problem yeah but that's yeah. something that's yeah. something to keep in mind that i found really interesting yeah that's a really good point actually and i mean i don't know how many of our listeners are going to have a problem with an aquarium Get bringing moisture to their business <laughs> don't get me wrong that would be a really cool thing to have in the print shop but that's a pretty unique that's a really good story that's pretty unique actually but we do see that all the time from people that maybe store their garments in like a garage or something and obviously in the climates that we live in it's cold it's damp it's not you know the most humid of climates to store them in and by mm. the time they do get on the press i've seen it before where customers will put a garment on especially things that are thicker like hoodies and sweatshirts 
pre-press them and you can see the moisture coming out mm. of the garment when that press comes up. But then like you said, maybe they pre-press for longer, but there's a fine line between A, how long you want to pre-press for because you don't want to be adding extra time onto that production process because then you lose time and time is money, right? So trying mm. to keep that pre-press to three to five seconds is key, I would say. But then also from a scorch point of view, like you, as much as you know, you can, you, you can very easily heat apply garments. I mean, it's what we do for a living, but you, if you do it for too long, you do run that risk of, you know, scorching the garment, depending on sort of what temperature it's on. You don't want to pre-press for that long because you've still got the main application to go. Um, yeah. So how did, how did he solve that problem in the end? I think we, um, we, we looked at like using two or three degrees more and, and that did the trick. So, I think like if it went any higher, it would have like scorched the uh, the garment. But so it mm -hmm. was like this, this tiny difference that that made all the difference. Yeah. yeah, sometimes it is really minor, isn't it? I say the same thing with pressure. Like the second, mm -hmm. it, if you've got pressure on like a four and you add like a cover sheet underneath, that can be enough to push it to five because mm -hmm. Hotronics machines are so sensitive, which is a good thing. Um, but yeah, tiny, tiny changes when you're making adjustments to things like that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's only uh, we we recorded a, a video about like the perfect pressure, and it's only a quarter turn for like a full degree of pressure, and have it at zero, and then <laughs> look into the camera and be like, so no, <laughs> and then have perfect. Quite difficult w without looking at it. <laughs> Yeah, especially when you're filming as well, it's, it's harder to do. I find that really difficult when I do the like Friday lives that we do here and you're constantly changing platens and garments and transfers and the pressure of the press goes like this all the time because you're swapping what's under yeah. it all the time, which is why if you watch my lives, anyone listening, you might notice I tend to go for the air machines because it's just so much easier because it does it for you. But yeah, it is such a tiny, tiny change. And that's what makes me laugh when I see, you know, if we have people message in and say that they have, you know, marks on their garments, heat press boxes and and they, you see how much pressure they're putting through. And we're like, oh, just, um, you know, add a bit more pressure. And they turn the whole thing twice. And you're like, no, oh, what are you doing? It's too much, too far. Oh, we have a problem with that too, uh, for sure. We have the saying in German, it's uh, viel hilft viel, which in English, it's like a lot uh, helps a lot. But that's not true at all for pressure um, and when heat applying. Yeah, it's the polar opposite. Yeah, well, yeah, the perfect pressure is perfect, probably. Are there any other common mistakes that you see people making from a technique point of view when they're heat applying? Um, not waiting long enough for the, uh, the the press to fully heat up is certainly a thing. Um, really? That's interesting. Yeah, um, I guess people are impatient. But um, like too much pressure is, is probably the biggest thing. Not even like having the, the platen too far down so it presses too much but but even putting your body weight on the on the press to have more pressure um that's probably the most common mistake i would say i find it quite amusing if i'm honest as to when people act surprised when that happens because over time if you're overpressuring it like that you'll, you'll damage your heat press eventually and then when you actually show them how easy it should be because heat printing should be easy right that's how our machines have been designed and when people realize how easy it should be and how much force they've been putting through it mm. i think it does shock a lot of them but then also in my head i'm like how do you think that putting that amount of force through a machine is good for it pro pro yeah probably because it's it's hard to understand how the transfer can stay on the on the textile if the force that you apply isn't like so much <laughs> yeah you're really like pushing it in there but then you get the opposite problem of like the yeah. adhesive coming out from underneath the the ink right and then you get and it doesn't stay on just as well for that people think that by putting more pressure through it it sticks better but in reality you're just pushing the adhesive out which means the colors or the ink is going to come off if like just as easily because you're removing the adhesive from it and squishing it out the sides yeah i mean if i were unsure if the um if the print sticks to the textile i wouldn't use more pressure i would just print again for like five seconds and use a cover sheet and then you can be pretty sure that it's uh, that it's good. Yeah, I mean, we always recommend, I mean, I know you guys do as well, but time, temperature, pressure being the three things that you stick to. And if you're using Styles products, whether you're in the UK, whether you're in Germany, anywhere in Europe, or whether you're in America, um, you can get 
the best transfer products in the world with the easiest to follow application instructions. They're all one step. None of them need that second hit, which, you know, is what takes time and money out of your production process. If you're using a transfer that needs a second press once it's been peeled, stop what you're doing. Please, I beg you, it is not a good idea and you're not using a good transfer product. But yeah, you can get the world's number one transfers anywhere in the world from Styles. Um, and they are all designed to apply at a very specific time, temperature and pressure. So you don't have to worry about you know, guessing or anything like that. The only time that you might need to make some adjustments is if you're printing onto a more sensitive material or something like that, where you need a thicker cover sheet or maybe some lower heat or something like that. I don't think you, I don't think you've missed anything. I think that was the perfect summary. <laughs> perfect summary. Is there anything else you wanted to discuss today, Hagen? Have you got anything else on your list before we wrap up the episode? Nothing, uh, nothing on my, on my list here. No. <laughs> Cool. Okay. Well, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to come on and speak to me on the podcast. I've really enjoyed having this conversation with you. Thank you so much for having me. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the Garment Decorators podcast on whatever platform you're listening on, whether that be YouTube, Apple, Spotify, or any of the other platforms. And we will be back next week with another Garment Decorators podcast episode. Thanks, everyone.